I'm Kerry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind the scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is Purple Roads. Welcome to Purple Roads. I'm Kerry Stinson, and what a, a show we have this week. We have got Scott Durbin and Rich Collins from the Imagination Movers. How are you guys? Doing <laughs> great. And this, this is fun. Um, I, I got to start off and tell you, my girlfriend's going crazy about this episode. <laughs> Her kids love you guys, and she loves you guys. And I, you know, that's kind of the best way to start with this is that you all made music not only for the kids, but also for the adults. Well, that's nice of you to say, yeah. Uh, we definitely, um, you know, we, we always just had, have a lot of fun making music. We, I think I looked at our ASCAP statement the other day and there's like 240 listings or something now. Yeah. And, uh, and we just got together, um, the four movers and our, and our other musician friend got together at a like a fishing camp that Scott Durbin found uh, <laughs> on a bayou uh, in about an hour outside of New Orleans. And we wrote another, you know, four or five songs that we're going to start recording and, and get going. So uh, we, we have a lot of fun making music. And I promise, yeah, we, we've never thought like, oh, let's just make a, let's make a song specifically for such and such age. It's always been like, let's just make the funnest song we can think of. So hopefully that's, that comes across. Well, I'm here in Texas, and you all, both of you, you all, both of you are in Louisiana, <laughs> you know, as Texans. Um, I know it's been, it's been, we've had it tough here lately in Texas, but we know it's been tough during COVID with you guys. How are things going there? Well, you know, obviously it's, uh, especially in, I, I'm in Lafayette, which is two hours west of New Orleans, and the Acadiana region's been hit hard. Uh, and so it's been difficult. I know it's affected us as the movers. Um, you know, we, we rely on touring quite a bit um, and we have not played a show since February. I think it was a Mardi Gras show uh, that we played. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of shut down our, uh, our, our ability to, to generate income, but, uh, but also, you know, it definitely makes you in tune with what's going on uh, locally, regionally, nationally, uh, just because, uh, you know, to be empathetic to, what's going on and how it's affecting just such a cross, you know, section of our culture and, and, and community. Well, we're talking also about the fact that you guys, you've, you've, you're not touring. And I know that's got to be tough, obviously, you know, financially, but just not being able to connect with the fans has got to be really difficult. Yeah. I mean, I think a, a, a large degree of our live show is interactive. And so, you know, even the prospects of returning to touring and not being able to do what we normally do, uh, you know, is definitely uh, uh, disheartening. You know, it's a little, uh, it's definitely something that, you know, we haven't even really thought about, like it wants to get the opportunity to go back on the road, what that's going to look like, especially given if there's any, you know, uh, situations that, you know, a protocol that we need to put in place to keep everybody uh, feeling uh, safe um, and, and what we're doing. So it, it's definitely something that uh, it's in the back of my mind, but uh, Lord knows, I mean, the opportunity to just perform uh, is, is such a, a humbling experience uh, and appreciating our audience as we've done, because that's generally how we survive is, is, is touring. So it's, it's definitely a part of our heart that's not there right now. Well, and I mean, have you, have you tried some of the online? I know, you know, everyone's kind of adapt. We've had to adapt here at Purple Roads and go online. Um, have you tried some of that? How is, does that work for you all? We, we did, uh, we've done a few Facebook live streams and things yeah. like that. Um, you know, we, we didn't monetize anything. We just did it as a way to, to reach people. Uh, like we, we, we did a broadcast when we were at, the, at our writing retreat. Um, but funny you should mention because it actually uh i think we didn't know it but halfway through the thing froze it was like we were broad broadcasting for 20 minutes to no one you know but um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh but so and then actually I, i've done a few broadcasting things like that where i worked really hard set up a light and did this and that and the other thing and then i went back and looked at the actual broadcast and it's like stop you know yeah. right 
it's basically worthless. So um, I know people have been successful at it. In fact, I was just talking to a, a music manager about one of his acts that's got written up in Rolling Stone this this week about being maybe the uh, one of the most successful like um, pivoters to live streaming. But we we, we probably could do a little more. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It, well, it's, it's very, it's hard. I, I think the one thing that's been good is that people are a little forgiving or maybe a lot forgiving now. Cause I think the other part that's important to this is as much as you've missed the fans, the fans miss you. Right. And yeah. We, I mean, we see your shows. We do our best to try to be engaged on, you know, uh, on Twitter and uh, Facebook and Instagram, but it's hard. It's hard. It's hard for that. Uh, uh, not having that just kind of interaction, that that organic interaction. Scott and Dave are our uh, social media uh, experts, um, and we and we appreciate their <laughs> their ideas and uh, uh, follow through. That's like uh, Smitty and I aren't as aren't as instinctive about it. Let's say, you know. Well, it's getting a little better because from, from my other work, I have to. You know, well, yeah, but it, it's tricky, especially now coming up with new content, you know, and keep it, keep it in, not posting the same thing all the time. Right. Yeah, yeah. Dave's a great uh, subtweeter. You know, he does a, a, a great job at like anybody who mentions us, he'll respond to them and they'll, they'll be, uh, you know, a slack jaw that the movers responded him on Twitter or something like that. But he, he's super witty when, when it comes to uh, uh, the comments that he posts on social, you know, on Instagram or, or Twitter. He's really good at it. It's quite good. Yeah, so if you're wondering whose witty remark it was, it was probably Dave. Probably Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Most certainly wasn't Rich or Smith. Um, good to know, good to know. I'll take note If I that. post something, it's very literal. Like, here, look at this new thing that we have. <laughs> I don't know. But isn't that why, how it all works, right? You've got the literal and the, and the witty and all that together. Yeah, I hope, I hope. It makes <laughs> it happen. So tell me how the, the movers came about. How did this all start? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's funny because all the, all the movers started having families around the same time. We all lived in the same neighborhood in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and I had a friend who, had a, who, was a, who worked at a local PBS affiliate. And, uh, you know, one of the things you become very aware of when you have children is you become a, 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 an evaluator of children's media whether it be music or video or movie or what have you. And so one of the things you immediately notice is the lack of real people. Uh, and so, you know, we grew up with Captain Kangaroo and Mr. Rogers uh, and even local live action kids shows, there was a real person component. Uh, and so, you know, at, uh, at our family birthday parties for our kids, uh, probably one and two at the time, now they're in college uh, or, or high school seniors, um, you know, we started kicking around the idea of this lo local live action kids show that was music based because like, you know, Rich and I played music growing up, Smitty played music. Uh, and so that's sort of where the, the idea came is like sharing this idea, uh, all kind of buying into it. Um, and then meeting at Dave's house, uh, you know, after all the kids were asleep and really kind of brainstorming what the idea was. Uh, and having an educational background, you know, I knew as a teacher, some of the deficiencies I saw on kids and, you know, one of them was, was creativity, you know, you know, seeing a stick as a stick instead of, you know, the opportunity for it to be a baton or uh, a flute, a pretend flute, you know, any of those things. And so, you know, there was definitely an idea early on that we wanted it to be, you know, educational, music-based, uh, and then have real people as, 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 as the drivers. Yeah. It's, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it was what, 2002 and yeah. Scott had made those funny commercials for the for, uh, <laughs> the local PBS affiliate, and we were at his son's birthday party, uh, and Scott started talking about this idea, and and I think that um, it's it's kind of a miracle. It's one of those things that could have easily been a conversation after a beer, and then never brought up again. But for whatever reason, we were all at at a stage in our life uh, where we wanted to keep a. Uh, we wanted to keep talking about this idea. And so it was only a couple of days later, we gathered mm -hmm. and we started sketching out ideas for, for, you know, um, you know, let, let's workshop a, a script for a first television show for, uh, let's workshop a concept. Let's write a couple of songs. And I'm telling you within the first two weeks, we, we had um, just strummed the basics of what would be the theme song to imagination movers. 
uh, and, a, and another couple of songs. And for me, it, a big, uh, a big uh, turning point or a big moment was um, I got permission from my wife to, to go uh, spend a few thousand dollars on a, on a Mac, an iMac, yeah. Pro Tools, uh, the worst microphone in the world, and a little keyboard, and uh, set it up. We set it up in the back of my house, and within honestly, from that first conversation, it was probably only a few weeks later, we were recording our first uh album you know and uh a lot some all that stuff got remixed or re-recorded later but um a lot of the ideas that came out from those first just couple of meetings survived on to be part of the television show that's been broadcast in 50 countries they survived you know they get played in every time we play a concert whether we're in asia north america or europe it was all from these first couple of conversations um so you know it's 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 inspiring. It's pretty forward thinking to to already be planning out the TV show <laughs> as you're as you're doing this. Where did the confidence come that you guys could do this? Well, I think we we I think we knew that it was a great idea. You know, this idea of you know these kind of blue collar brainstormers. You know, the idea warehouse itself was a metaphor for a child's brain and mind. Uh, I, I think we were super tenacious because everything worked together um, with the four of us um, in a way that I don't think any of us foresaw, you know, I mean, it was just really, you know, whatever strength I might've had or weakness was filled in by another guy. Uh, and so because it, we, we had this amazing idea, I think that gave us, like you said, the confidence and the tenaciousness to not, um, to not take no for an answer. In fact, I think we did, we were very, you know, not to give ourselves the proverbial pat on the back, but we were very smart about how we, how we pitched it. Uh, we made sure that even like our initial pitches to the local PBS affiliates, we gave them every reason not to say no, you know, that if they were going to question us, we had the answer that they were, they were going to look for. Um, and, you know, in those early pitches, they were like, we love this idea. We love the concept. We love the music. But we don't have any money. And because of that, we, we said, well, look, hey, if we create the, con uh, the content for you, would you put it on the air? And that's where a lot of, you know, that, that next step took place is that we went out, <laughs> did videos at our friend's house. Uh, and in fact, those videos actually made it to our, when we, when we started our, our first uh, presence on Disney, those early videos that we created back in the day, um, we went and did it, you know, we just basically had an idea and it's great, like Rich referenced, it's great to have an idea, but the execution has to happen for it to, to really be, to, to, to have meaning. And so we, for some reason, unforeseen reason, we, we, we made it happen and we believed in it. And I think that's why we got from point A to point B. It's funny to think, Scott, about the, um, the stuff we made on our, on our own, for, I mean, the tiniest budget you can imagine. Um, and then you compare that to some of the, like the, the concert special that Disney filmed for us with this big broadcast television budget. And both of those pieces of content are still out there and still being consumed and watched by people. And your average five-year-old kid doesn't notice the difference and doesn't care. <laughs> it's like the one that, like we shot this first concert that we did and we, all we could afford was some lights. Like, oh, I lost, ah, uh, weird. I just lost my light. <laughs> Um, <laughs> It'll happen. It's a perfect, it's a perfect example because I was going to say we we couldn't afford proper lighting, so we had just like this lights on the stage shining up at us, you know. And so we all looked a little bit uh, bizarre. I don't know, <laughs> kind of like this. Um, but uh, you know, and then and then if you compare that to the to um, you know to what came later, uh, it's it's an amazing journey. But I would say this that um, there were two things that we did. There's a lot of things that we did that were ridiculous and that were essential to what happened later. And one was that we borrowed a bunch of money and went to New York City to <laughs> exhibit uh, at Toy Fair. You know, Toy Fair, I, like the big. I, I was one of my first jobs with Barney was to yeah. be at Toy Fair. I know it well. Okay, you know well, Javits Center. Well, we we spent all we had. We all went up there with our wives in 2003, I guess four. Yeah, yeah. And. Um, the, the, the women there basically adopted us and they gave us all this extra exposure that we didn't really pay for. <clears throat> but basically you couldn't walk in or out of the Javits Center without being, uh, without seeing us on a stage, hitting the trash cans and singing. 
Um, and a lot of sort of deals began from that event. Then the other thing that we did that was ridiculous was that we, uh, after having a lot of success as like an indie band playing all around New Orleans, we, uh, <laughs> we booked our own show at the UNO Lakefront Arena. And we spent like eight months promoting this thing. And we, tickets were like 10 bucks. But we got thousand something like that in there, uh, filled it up. So it looked like a big arena show. We, we, we timed it where they gave us a good deal on the rent because it was the day after like a, a high school graduation. So right. like it was already configured. And we were friends with the guys that were running the venue. So we basically got this thing and filmed our own arena concert. Um, and that, that DVD was the thing that got, was one of the, the products that got into the hands of the people at Disney Channel eventually. Um, do I have that right? The, the DVD yeah. existed, right? Yeah, I mean. Uh, it wasn't I, just the first album. I think it no, was. Stir, stir It Up was, Stir It Up was, it, it's still one of the best sellers. And that was that DVD we basically yeah. self-financed. And a, a local director, Francis James, made it for us. He helped us out and did it shoestring. Anyway, that product got to them along with some other stuff like our coloring book or whatever. Yeah. And uh, that's what brought them to see us at Jazz Fest in 2005. So in but, fact, we we were friends with the Children's Museum. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. But we yeah. were friends with the Children's Museum and we would go in after dark. The Children's Museum had closed <laughs> because they had our sets. You know, they basically <laughs> used use their rooms as sets for our different musical videos. Yeah, here's a fun fact. Uh, we, we were loading out of the Louisiana Children's Museum after shooting these videos that had become absolutely iconic, right? Uh, and we were, we were leaving at around three or four in the morning from this downtown New Orleans venue. And the plan was for us to uh, go to sleep and wake up and convene again to shoot two more videos on another location. Uh, well, as we're loading out, uh, some New Orleans police officers just patrolling the neighborhood, which is, which is not a neighborhood, it's like a it's like an industrial area. that There shouldn't be people there at three in the morning. Right. They probably rightfully so started running the license plates of who the hell were the, who the heck were these people, you know, <laughs> loading out. And uh, uh, unfortunately, a member of our crew had an outstanding parking ticket. A key member of our crew. The director. So, <laughs> the director of our videos. And his wife and infant child are with us as the police put him in handcuffs and put him in the back of a car and drive him to NOP uh, to the central Paris lockup prison yeah. where he spent the next 24 hours <laughs> like and by the way it turned out the ticket was was incorrect he did not have a ticket it was a computer error oh. and he spent 24 hours in the Orleans Parish prison uh, with the jail yeah yeah and unfortunately has a great well, I mean fortunately he's got a great story to tell now yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and to his credit, after he got out of jail, he came directly back and shot the rest of our videos the next day. Yeah, that is to his credit. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's so fascinating. I come from a show that you know Barney was was not typically Hollywood either. We were in Allen, Texas. Um, a lot of the story you're telling is very similar to what <laughs> what we were doing. Um, I've had Mr. McFeely on this show. And Mr. Rogers was another show, and Officer Clemens, Francois Clemens, um, and they were doing some of this stuff too. And I think it's really fascinating that these kids shows, several of them, have found success by just not accepting no. Uh, right. I think you're, I think you're right. I think you know, especially a lot of the ones you named. There, there's definitely a labor of love that is there. You know, in our, in our mind sight, you know, we, we created a motto and a dogma early on of like, you know, the, the movers motto, which is reach high, think big, work hard, have fun. Um, and we were, I think the authenticity of what our, our belief in that motto and demonstrating it, not just in action, but in words. Um, you know, I, I think when you look at children's programming, so much can be so convoluted and created to be marketed and, you know, and become toyetic. You know, those are words that you often hear all the time. Yeah. And so I think for us in a lot of those properties, you mentioned that there's a heart there. There's a heart that sort of leads uh, the idea and the concept to a place where, you know, it's not just created, you know, I, it's, it's loved and nurtured. And then, you know, that's part of the process instead of just kind of being formed and, and sent out, so. And Rich, we got your lights looking good again. Well, I opened, a, <laughs> opened up a blind, hopefully that helps. Uh, it looks good, it looks good. Um, well, you, you nailed it, Scott. I, I was just going to say, I think the thing that's so important is the authenticity. That's what kids respond to. 
Yeah. They, they don't fake, fake anything. They don't no. fake a smile. You know, if they, if you, if they're not, if you're not resonating with them, they'll let you know, you know? So, so fortunately we, uh, we, we, we hit, uh, we hit something. So we were, we were humbled by it. You, you've, you've definitely hit something <laughs> and been very successful with it. I, I find that one of the big keys to kids TV and kids entertainment is music, which is where you, you really, really hit that. Um, when you're coming up with these songs, I mean, is it, is it themes you're, you're seeing with your kids or themes you just see kids need or kind of where are you going when you're writing these songs? Yes. Because uh, <laughs> uh, we, um, so the, the first batch of songs we made was, ba we, we wrote around a premise for an episode. We had this idea for a healthy eating episode of this show that didn't exist yet. And that's why we wrote a song <laughs> called My Favorite Snack and another one called that Snack and ABCs. And these are extremely like uh, classic kid song sounding songs, you know. <clears throat> but then um, there's another one called I, I Eat It Anyway about yeah, yeah. broccoli or whatever. <laughs> but um, so, so that was like specifically us writing to a, a, a topic that we thought would be appropriate for kids. But then for sure, it became a thing of us um, taking ideas from our own lives so when movers began <clears throat> we i think dave scott dave scott and i all had two little ones uh i have five kids now uh smitty now has one daughter so between us what that's i don't know the math that's 11 or something no <laughs> nine eight, five six seven eight nine ten ten now yeah well Is that right? if, yeah, we, if we if we can, yeah if we include kyle it's 12. okay so it's 10 kids between Anyway, so at all different ages and stages, so yeah, so like I remember we, we at one point, Scott, I remember the night you and I were writing I Want My Mommy, which is about, you know, needing to go to bed, you know, so it's like a, a song more for like a two or three year old. And then I remember it wasn't a few years later, we're writing this song about field trips and uh, riding <laughs> on the bus and all that fun stuff. And it's because our kids were getting older, you know. So it absolutely followed our, our family's age. Um, now, I mean, we've got college age children, you know, we're not so much writing about, um, you know, th them anymore, but I mean, to some extent, like I saw, we were really proud of the song on our last album. We did a duet with Lisa Loeb, another Texan. Um, I know, and, I know very well of her. Yes. She's awesome. And she's a friend and a fan and we're uh, fans of hers, but so it started off as Scott had written some lyrics about, um, uh, about a caterpillar. And then it just, through our writing together, it started turning into a song where one verse was a little girl singing to her caterpillar saying, don't, don't change, don't, don't, don't turn into a butterfly and, and leave just yet. I know you're going to, but don't do it yet. And then the second verse was a, a parent singing to his child, his daughter, saying the same thing, basically. Uh, I know you're going to grow and you're going to do great things, but let's just, let's not rush it, you know? Yeah. And so that song's called Butterfly Wings. And it's inspired by our children, but almost a little bit more inspired by the wisdom we've had as parents. And you see how fast it, it goes, you know? Yeah. So. Is, is there pressure that you've had so much success when you're writing these songs to hit the I, next one? I don't or, feel it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't feel it. I think we, you know, we, it's been funny in the sense that, you know, we just sort of write and, and nowadays, you know, we might have an idea of like, Hey, let's, you know, let's explore this, but, a lot of times it's just, we start jamming and, uh, you know, Rich will do kind of like a vocal melody on top of something. And, and I might say, Hey, you know, this, I, I jot down, uh, like, uh, we have a, I think a song that we're going to record, um, the sound, uh, when robots break down, when robots break down. And I was like, I threw that at him and he started riffing, riffing on it. And, uh, you know, it was an age appropriate concept and, uh, we thought it would be, uh, a cool idea and it and it became something you know so so a lot of times you know it just there's a wonderful kind of uh magic that happens when we when we all four get together and, and work on songs that uh, I, I don't know how or why <laughs> i don't question it too much i just kind of let it ride and enjoy it so yeah yeah i mean so go ahead okay no 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 go, please go ahead i was just saying this i i, I would say that um uh when it comes to our, our writing, you know, each guy has their things. And um, I feel like I, I can, I, I enjoy writing hooks and melodies and parts all the time. And, uh, but uh, Scott, sometimes I, I might have a hook 
like for instance, I'm thinking of this, uh, Scott, that, that song, the, the, the one we wrote in the, um, in Germany on the military bases. We, oh, yeah, we yeah, had yeah. a series of shows <laughs> on, um, uh, at, for, for, for the families of troops. We've done it a couple of times and, and, and you play in these big like spaces and there's this, remember we were, we were having a, a sound check that was like going on for an hour and a half until our, <laughs> our, until our um, audio guy finally just unplugged us because he was getting <laughs> sick of it. But we were just writing and goofing around. And there's a song that I think is like, just epic. It's cool, the coolest thing in the world. But if, if I play it back, I'm, I'm singing gibberish, right? There's no words, you know? Right. And so uh, that, that's, uh, Scott's good because that, that was happening the other day when we were writing this new thing. I was singing a bunch of stuff, but I didn't know any word. I had no theme. And he, he's like, uh, how about robots breaking down? Like, <laughs> okay, you know? And so, that, you know, that, 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 that we help each other along that way a lot. Um, um, but no, we, I, I don't, you know, it's funny. We, um, oh, I can't reach it, but, you know, we won an Emmy Award a few years ago for, for, for one of our songs and, and had nominated for another one. And, uh, you know, it's fun when you go online and you realize that, especially when you consider all the translations into different languages, I mean, our songs have been played, what, definitely more than a billion times all over, you know, YouTube. Uh, but that all kind of is abstract. And I find that if we're getting together, you know, to write, it's like, to me, it's almost like we're writing the first song and we're just having fun. And, or it's like all one song, if that makes sense. Like we're just continuing to make things. Um, yeah, be creators. It's yeah, I, I can see it. And it's very impressive. You, Barney never tried to entertain adults. Mm -hmm. we, were, right. we were just about the kids. And so most of those songs are, are very kid-like only. And right. the parents um, loved them just because the kids loved them. Because they didn't, they, I can't even tell you how many times I, I heard, oh my God, if I hear, you know, the I Love You song again or something like that, <laughs> <laughs> which, I, which I understand, but completely different with you guys. I was fascinated when we were talking about with my girlfriend and, and the kids last night and both sides. I mean, she was singing them. She was going crazy about your songs. Obviously, she learned about them with the kids, but she loves them on her own and then the kids love them. Okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's a very impressive balance. Do you, There's something I mean, we're really proud of. I mean, well, you yeah. should be. Did you did you go after? Were you going after the kids, or were you going after the adults, or were you just writing music? Just really the writing music part of it. Uh, I, I think we observed a few years ago makes a good point that we had a. You know, it's a different philosophy, and maybe maybe um, from us, it, it, it's what worked for us. Sure. But we we remember that at, at a movers concert. Uh, the majority of people at that show are adults. It's usually two parents to every child or maybe a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle. So we were, we were you know, the, the way we do a live concert, it was every rock and roll cliche, funny trick you could think of, we're <laughs> gonna do that. Uh, and the songs that we do, and I wanted to mention this before, like, you know, so of those 240 songs, there's like a dozen that we know are the surefire successful uh, concert, you know, set list song. Right. And it's the ones where the, like the song jump up, which ends the episodes, but that song works great because you can explain it in two minutes and then everyone does it. It's just, it's this dance and a shout and a, and a coordinated activity. You know, it's going to work. Right. Uh, but there's so many other songs that we love that maybe aren't going to be uh, a successful concert song. You know, I mean, probably if, if Scott, or if you and I made our, like our, our playlist of cool, our favorite, mover songs it might not include any of the ones we play in concert because it's going to be all these rarities and b-sides and things yeah we, you definitely learn that you know what in, in in examining our catalog what works live sure. uh and then what doesn't and you know of course those mid-tempo and slow songs are not going to go over you might <laughs> right. be able to get away with one of right. them uh and so you definitely have to create uh, an opportunity that you keep the, the the you know the kids engaged but like but like rich said it's like you know, the people who come with the kids are, are whether, uh, uh, you know, known to them or not, they're modeling behavior. And when they're engaged with the show, because it operates on some, some different levels, you know, we have jokes for the parents. We might reference Belle Bib DeVoe or something like that. Right. Uh, or Blink-182. Um, but the, the, the concept and, and everything we're doing is still age and developmentally appropriate. So we're not doing anything that I wouldn't be proud of, you know, doing. 
However, we're, we're making it much more accessible. And I don't think it's, it was, it was not necessarily something conscious. It was always something that the music we play are really is, is, is kind of, um, you know, reflective of the music we grew up to. You know, we listen to the police, we listen to the clash, those kinds of bands informed our sensibilities. Uh, and so when we create music together and like Smitty's a big reggae and ska uh, fan. And so you find that musical influence, Dave kind of likes the Ben Folds Five and that kind of thing. And, and you find that in, and then Rich and I bring our, our sensibilities into it. And it just, we just create something. And I think musically is for anybody and everybody. Uh, and I think if you have a great low end, uh, kids are going to love it, that beat and that drive. Um, but the lyrics are, uh, you know, obviously age and developmentally appropriate for kids, but also accessible for adults too. You know, riding my bike, things like that. You know, it's kind of universal. And so we've been fortunate to, 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 be, uh, to have things that, that have hit for both. Do you think the genres of the music has helped? Like, yeah. I mean, not many kids, not many you're not seeing a lot of ska <laughs> yeah. and I love that you're doing it, but you're not seeing a lot of that. Was that part of the decision with the styles of music? I think it's really just, it was all, it's just the, it's just what we were steeped in, you know? And, and so, um, you know, my favorite rappers, uh, I'm thinking of some of my favorite rappers, like, um, you know, some of the iconic people like Jay-Z or someone like that. But then right on that list uh, is, is Mover Scott. <laughs> you know, uh like he, he scott grew up listening to uh, and continues to listen to all sorts of people and you know i i, I literally some some of the some of the parts that he put down on some of the songs that we did you know uh, especially when we were making this show because i should I, I should explain that but we we had like a um a creative wonderland because mm -hmm. so from the beginning of movers until Hurricane Katrina. I recorded three albums in the back of my house. Those were super fun. All the guys would come over, we'd write, write, write. Uh, I, then I would sit there and, oh my God, like edit and, <laughs> and work and read and play things and try and make it sound like, like a record. You know, basically yeah. I was learning how to use Pro Tools. Well, then when the, when the TV show got picked up and then the pilot got approved and we went into production, everything changed. Instead, we were out at a sound stage out in the suburbs uh, for four years where we made the three seasons of the show and we had a studio in the building and we had a like a, essentially we had a full-time like music supervisor producer engineer guy and so we Jason Ryan he's a friend of ours he did an amazing job and what, what would happen is we'd be shooting uh, a scene let's say we were doing the, the, the episode about the cold room and we're all wearing our you know, it's probably summer in New Orleans and it's 100 degrees, but we're all wearing winter coats and fake snow and all this stuff. But then we would run down the hall to record, to like write and record the song for an episode coming up three weeks later. Maybe it's a song about a butterfly or a song about a knight or a pirate or something, you know? And so, but in this case, we'd go in there, run in there real quick, jot down an idea, play a part, God knows what. And then Jason would, <laughs> he'd be the one in there. Putting it all together. Yeah, putting it all together, together. Yeah. And so, um, it was a really fun creative moment in our life. And so, but I'm thinking like, you know, some of these things, like you probably be scratching out a, 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 a like the third verse rap verse on a, on a piece of paper and you, you run in there between takes and, and, you know, I'm thinking there's a song. It's funny. Uh, we all have the ones we like more or less. Smitty and I love this song called <laughs> Wanna Be Frog. <laughs> It's kind of Zeppelin-y, a little, I don't know. Scott and Dave can't stay in the Zeppelin. Um, <laughs> it's just whatever. But, you know, so there's, there's, there's divisions. But we love this song, and it's got, it's got a Scott rap in there that I think is hilarious. <laughs> he does it, like, in a frog voice. <laughs> and, I, and I remember thinking when you did it, they're going to they're gonna make you redo this. They're not going to let you do this. And because uh, a lot of times they would, we, would, we would get stuff kicked back to us. Uh, and for, I was amazed they did not make you, uh, they didn't push back on the, uh, no, cause my, it was kind of like, uh, anyway, it's a crazy, yeah. it's so, a good, <laughs> that kind of stuff, you know, and that song I, I, I got to play, um, I don't know what text being a Texan, you know, ZZ Top, of course, of course. Um, so, you know, uh, in La, uh, the song LaGrange, it's a drum fill. I don't know what you call it, but it's like, yep. I know exactly what you're talking about. 
And I got to use that drum fill in context for this song. And hundred percent, it was the correct fill. Like this <laughs> very rare that that would be the right fill, but it was. And so I got to use it on that song. And uh, anyway, that's probably why it's one of my favorite songs. <laughs> so I'm learning very quickly the amount of passion you all, you guys have for this. <laughs> because that's almost, you know, being in the industry and being part of a show, I understand how difficult it is. And I didn't have to go run off and record songs. I, oh, you know, yeah. We obviously had someone else that was doing the music and recording, and there was a whole, a whole thing happening there. So the fact that you guys had to do both, and it doesn't sound like it was exhausting, but it had to have been. It was fun, I, I, all I can say. It was exhausting. I think I marvel at, at, at our creative output. It was incredible. And when you think about it, you know, I think Rich sort of kind of referenced early on, you know, our first three albums really paralleled our children's development. And so, you know, you might have had a, on our first album, Healthy Snacks. And then by the third, you know, riding your bike and all that kind of stuff because our kids had age. But when we started doing the show, that was the first time we were starting to write songs to, 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 to move the narratives along. And so, you know, we would have songs about a robot chase song, which I, you know, I think I echo Rich in, in, in how Disney allowed that song to get through because, you know, we were referencing in that song everything from Star Trek to Star Wars and, uh, and everything else, dilithium crystals. And, uh, and, it, and it's a really kind of an electronic punk song. Uh, I, it's one of my favorites simply because I, I'm still astounded that it's, that it's that it made it to the show um but it's uh it was funny because you know we just we were doing what like rich said we, we were having fun when we were doing it and the and i look back and i just think gosh you know how the amount of creativity we we we, we condensed in a three-year period of time really under the gun of filming and, and and touring when we weren't filming uh you know i'm amazed uh, well, you know really, what i think what happens when you, when you are it's uh what's the thing when, when you're busy when you're doing a lot, you can you can do a lot. And then like right now we're in a pandemic or whatever, like you start slowing down, everything seems like it's harder. But like we were going nuts. Cause then we also had like what little kids back home and you yeah. know, feeling you know, up, wanting to help as much as you possibly could. Um, but um What well, how much were you touring during that time too? The way it would work is we we would this, we would shoot the the seasons of the show, which was what, six months. Yeah. How many how many episodes in a season? 25, 26. Okay. So it's basically an episode a week. So I think yeah, yeah 26 weeks or something. And then, um, and then, so yeah, that, this, this was like the crazy time in our life because it was like, we, we, when the first season happened, when the first season wrapped, we went on our first bigger tour, extended tour, you know, and, and then we came back and I don't know, I don't remember the chronology, but then we not long after started season two. And then when we wrapped that one, we went on a massive tour. 108 yeah 108 or 111 yeah 108 around there shows 108 shows uh and it was basically four months on the road with i think we had three like two day like hop on a plane leave the buses and just go home and kiss the kids um and that that was that was the biggest tour we have done and that that was the one that we got on the cover of polestar magazine and everything because we were one of the top tours of the year like of any category and then, um, and then we did season three, and we actually had another big tour, um, called, you know. And so uh, it, it was basically season tour, season tour, season tour, you know. And, and then things have slowed down since we, we didn't get renewed for fourth season, and uh, you know, really for, since then, what we've been doing is make we make albums and video content on our own schedule and tour at a more reasonable pace. So instead of going out for four months, we go out on. You know, we might like there was times when we go out for weeks or we go to Europe or Asia for weeks, but more likely than not, we'll go out for like a you know four, three or four day weekend, things like that. It's much more uh, uh, humane. Yeah, I, I think a big key early on, and I, I think even from our, our our beginning days, was each mover appreciated the the idea of balance, and I think that's one of the things we've always been been at the forefront of our of our relationships is you know we don't see ourselves just as movers we see ourselves as fathers as you know husbands um uh and so i think that and, and as, as friends you know i mean i think one of the great things about the movers and if anybody wants to take anything away is like you know we were friends before this we you know we kind of climbed the mountain um 
and we've been friends since. And so I think that's one of the biggest testimony, testimony, you know, testimonies of ours is just that, you know, a lot of people think, oh, when, you know, with success comes problems uh, and such, but, uh, you know, we've been able to, to kind of weather a lot of, a lot of things. And, uh, I, you know, I appreciate our friendship internally uh, as one of those things that uh, I think is just as significant as like an Emmy award that we might have that uh, makes great paperweight. Well, well it's, <laughs> it, it's very impressive because it, it is difficult. I've done the, the live, I understand the live aspect. Being out there for four months doing 108 shows is a lot in that period of time. And mm -hmm. then doing the show and the creativity and all of that stuff, it's very impressive. How, going into that a little bit further, how do you think you've done that? How have you found the balance um, between the movers to be, to have that harmony? I mean, you know, probably for us what it is, is that we were 30 when we started this whole thing. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really have a choice to some extent because we have, we have obligations that are more important than any career aspiration at that point. So uh, we had to, um, you know, take care of our families, uh, take care of our children, be there for them. You know, that was why, you know, there was a chance the show wasn't going to, was going to have to be filmed in, in Los Angeles and, or some other location. And that would have been, I'm not sure it would have happened. You know, I mean, the yeah, fact that they well, were able to come here after Katrina and, and shoot here and help us be, stay close to our families. I mean, Scott made, the, the, had the, the, had it worse of all of us because he had relocated to Lafayette already. Okay. So he would drive in um, and yeah. stay here during the week to shoot, and he would stay at his uh, mother and father-in-law's house, and basically right. became like that became a little family. Yeah. Uh, and then he would go and see your crew on the weekends. But um, you know, I think that's kind of what it. We were just old, older. We had responsibilities. We are also, um, you know, what we were doing wasn't um, it wasn't like uh, we weren't a punk rock band. We weren't a um, you know, some, some, uh, let's see, like a boy band, you know, we were like a dad band. <laughs> and we were always kind of like, we have fun. We, we, we know our music is good. And we know there's a sensibility that we have that's uh, a little bit subversive, let's say, or fun, you know, funny, like we're the only kids show on Disney that had a whole episode where we paid tribute to Bill Murray and <laughs> we did it, you know, stuff like that. But all that being said, we're still, dorks and um you know we would our, we had bus drivers who would tease us for being the lamest band he ever drove yes <laughs> this is true as we would play a show at what one and four and then we do meet and greets we get up get to our bus and have some kind of meal and by seven o'clock we would be watching some movie and by 9 30 we'd be asleep and <laughs> you know the only girls that ever came on our bus was like my mom and my sister <laughs> <laughs> so we just weren't cool in that sense you know yeah. but um uh, but i think it's more cool i do no we were i think i think you hit it you know we were mature i think you know i, I could not have imagined having success at like 20 or 21 yeah. oh yeah oh that would have been that would have been difficult to deal with but uh we, we had we had we had a we had a we had some uh serious network and support uh in the in our in the presence of our families and and children and what have you and so and we were friends, so that was, that was always a key. So what is it like for you to plan out, map out a TV show, and then you get a TV show? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, on, I, on, on Disney, by the way. Uh, it, it, this well, little it was, network called Disney. <laughs> I know, it was, it was strange because I think, you know, we believe so wholeheartedly in what we did and, and like kind of going back and talking about how tenacious we were. When we recorded our music, we would send it to pediatric wards in the UK because we knew that they would play it in, in for, the, for the kids they were, that were there. And that's, that's the kind of just like no stone unturned in getting our music and our brand out there. So the idea of, of working with Disney, it was funny because, you know, they came and saw us at Jazz Fest and they were like, hey, let's do something. And, 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 and we said no, you know, because I think part of that whole thing was like, we, we had had at the plan at that time that we were going to go the PBS route because here we had created so much, uh, you know, creative content and intellectual property that we wanted to maintain 
our rights to it. And so the PBS route was kind of the route we were going. And then of course Katrina happened and that, that was a game changer. You know, we had this, this, this offer on, on, uh, that Disney had presented. And fortunately by saying no, it improved. Um, and that's why a lot of the pre-existing concepts reverted back to us post Disney. Um, I, I won't say it was surreal because I almost like, you know, I don't, I always knew it was going to happen. I mean, it was kind of, you know, it's strange that I, you know, I, I don't want to take it for granted, but I, I just knew we had this great idea. It was going to happen, whether it was on Disney or, or somewhere else, I knew it was going to get done. Uh, but we were fortunate to have it on Disney because, you know, they, they did have, you know, their kids nowadays in Argentina who follow us and tell us how much Los Imaginadores uh, <laughs> were, um, were a part of their childhood. And I think, that's the cool thing now where we are is like you get not only parents and children and children who are watching it now are rediscovering it on Disney plus, but then you have these 18, you know, 16 to 18 year olds who grew up with us um, and appreciate the, what we brought uh, as far as children's programming was concerned. So fortunate. Talk to me because I know what a big deal jazz fest is. You keep mentioning that and kind of going past it. And I'm like, oh, let's go <laughs> back there a second. Let's talk about Jazz Fest. Yeah, it's so a huge do it deal in New Orleans. It is, and it's been important to us. So we, uh, we, we began, uh, you know, as playing at birthday parties uh, and uh, the Louisiana Children's Museum, uh, maybe a French Quarter Fest or some other little festivals around the area. Somebody brought up a balloon fest, Scott. Remember oh yeah, that? in Baton Rouge, wasn't that? In Baton uh, yeah, Rouge? Uh, we, were film, we were filming a, a tourism commercial this, uh, this week. Uh, Scott couldn't make it, but we were shooting like a little thing about, hey, Louisianans, you know, enjoy your own, you know, state. And, uh, and a woman, we were on a beach, on a lake beach, shooting a shot and this woman was there. She said, oh, I, I, we saw you at balloon fest. I was like, oh my God, that was like, almost 20 years ago but yeah. anyway jazz fest started having us play at their at, in their kids area and that's <clears throat> it, uh, we probably had done it our third or fourth time when disney came yeah. and it was you know at for, for us at that moment it was a, it was a spectacle because it was you know this little tent but at this point we had become a kind of a thing we've gotten a lot of press in the paper uh we became like kind of the the cool thing if you were like a wealthy New Orleans family, you definitely wanted to hire movers for whatever your event was. And like, we just kind of had buzz. And um, so the tent was absolutely bursting at the seams and it was great for them to see us in that context, you know? Um, and so that was, they came, they saw 2005, we uh, went out to dinner at GW Finns in the French Quarter and they, <laughs> you know, we schmoozed and brainstormed and all that. And then, um, uh, you know, so, since that time, Jazz Fest, uh, basically right after the Disney stuff started happening for us, Jazz Fest moved us to the big stages. So they put it, there's two big stages at either end of the fairgrounds. Uh, one's the, a a is it still Acura? Acura, yeah, yep. Okay, I believe Acura. so, huh? Gentilly yeah, stage. and the Gentilly stage. And, uh, we played both probably the same amount of time. Uh, what they do is they put us on like earlier in the day on the biggest stage, like it would be like, I don't know, uh, who had the, the big star would be closing that stage out, but we would, we would be like the second act. Wow. And, uh, and so we, there was a, the year it was probably Oh six. We had a, we had a board tape that someone found and then we had a bunch of New Orleans musicians sitting in with us. And I was like, wow. it sounded, it sounded great, you know, cause it's the, the audio production is like top notch and all the equipment in the back lines, top notch. And the, we had rehearsed a lot with these other musicians and, that was, that was a, that was like a good board tape from 06. But um, yeah. anyway, so then Jazz Fest, we put, we continue to play it. Um, uh, and, you know, it's, I feel like our, our history is interwoven with, with that. that. That's awesome. It's a, it's a very special, one of our uh, executive producers from Barney is from New Orleans. And oh, nice. so I, I know a lot about, about New Orleans through him um and how important and how cool that is yeah it was tragic not tragic but it was heartbreaking for everybody that that, we, that it couldn't happen this year of course mm -hmm. well uh, it will come back strong yeah I'm we were to... fortunate to play austin city limits music festival uh this year uh, and we had played it early on in our career and that's a wonderful festival in austin and uh 
uh, the people treated us so well. And that was one of those ones where I think when we played, half of our audience were parents and, 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 and small kids, and then half of the audience was 16 to 20 year olds at uh, Austin City Limits. Yeah, this past year, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, this past year. It was, and so it, it was really a, an eclectic experience and such a great thing. And we, we actually had friends of ours, uh, Laundry Day, that's in a band, um, you know, a bunch of 18, 19 year olds. They were kids when they, you know, they had pictures of the lead singer Sawyer w wearing a little mini mover outfit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so they were playing on at, at ACL at the same time. We went and hung out with them for a while, and we walked over there in our mover outfits, and we were stopped. I mean, almost like from from the kids tent to, or the kids area at, at at Austin City Limits to their stage, with people wanting to take pictures. So we could literally have just taken selfies from the second the festival opened till it closed. And um, I. I you know, we always say we want to do a like a, a tour for for older people. I I would love to do it somehow and figure out how to make that work. Because uh, yeah, the uh, the ironic college tour. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. The Wiggles are doing a do a variation on that. I don't know if you know they they do to an older crowd and they do a charity event. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I follow Anthony on uh, Twitter and and have had some little correspondence. But sometimes they'll do it as the cockroaches. Or yes. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, well, it's got to be fascinating for you that all of a sudden your audience grew up. And so there's now this these 18 year olds that love the movers. Yep. I get uh, like I, I get had two last night from uh, on either Facebook Messenger or Instagram. Yeah, here's one. This is from it's always Argentina. <laughs> Starts. Uh, you're the guy from the Imagination Movers. I love that show. I grew up watching it. And then I, and she said, I, I still remember the theme song. And I wrote, it's stuck in my head too. And then I got basically the screaming, the version of screaming, some, some profanity, I can't even say it, but uh, <laughs> you know, so and that, that's, that's basically, I would say every day. Yeah, we do. We get a lot. Old, older people that are like, just, I don't know how that, and I don't know why it's always Argentina, but. <laughs> You, you've struck a chord, obviously, in, in Argentina. Well, somebody yeah, we told did. me that Argentina is, is very uh, loyal to, 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 um, to bands and also very active on social media. Yeah, I never got the chance there. We actually performed in Mexico, talking mm -hmm. a little bit of the Latin, and it was unbelievable, the crowds, oh, that, that, the crowds that showed up for... I would love to go down. It, but yeah, well, this was 20 years ago, but it was an amazing two weeks of sold-out shows. It was amazing. Awesome. Okay, so I want to say one Barney-related story that's okay. sort of uh, canonical now, which is that right around the time we started the Movers, and I don't remember, Scott, maybe you might remember the chronology better than me, but I'm, I, I lived, uh, I live in a section of the world uh, that was, I'm, I'm like the second to last house before a street, and uh, across the street was this big um, football field, like stadium. Football field called Tagorma Stadium. Uh, it's where like all the high school football games are played. The Beatles played Tag Gorman Stadium in 1964. It's just like an old building where f football happens. But I remember I, I was opening the blinds up to my kids' two bedrooms in the front of my house. And there was this, I, don't, I had no warning of this, there was just this flow of people walking past my house. People, 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 people. And like parking everywhere. I was like, what in the world is going on? And I, and I followed the commotion over there. And it was some kind of Barney surprise. It was like a it, it was a free show. I, I remember my, McDonough Thirty Five was there. The their marching band was playing. Yeah, it was this big, it was like a, and it, the place holds like twenty thousand people or something. Yeah, how big? I don't know. It was a ton of people showed up, and for thirty minutes watched this Barney event, and then all just it was gone as fast as it came. Like, so is that the kind of thing that you would be a, a part I of? Did. Yeah, I did. It was uh, unbelievable. I did one up in Minnesota, 16,000 people per show, three shows, 30 minutes each show. It, yeah. was, it was crazy. And I, I think it's an important part of kids. We didn't have lights and all of those things, right? right. It was the right. purple dinosaur and his music, and that was it. And with kids entertainment, you don't need, you know, you think <laughs> about any big star, whoever that may be, music star, and they've got backdrops and, you know, dancer of, uh, you know, uh, Taylor Swift, all the things that she has. We don't need that. 
if you've got the music and the movement, and that's kind of where I want to go here with you guys, when you're doing these songs, are you thinking about movement? Are you thinking about how the the kids are going to react in, in that aspect of things? Yeah, some of them. Yeah. So, I, do you remember, I remember you and me in that hotel room in Birmingham writing Jump Up, which is our by far the, the biggest example of that for us. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, early on we learned through trial and error how to con construct a an amazing 60 to 70 minute um, concert experience for families that was interactive. And so we would do a lot of things like we would consciously look at like what big rock shows would have, whether that be like, you know, the, the pyrotechnics and things like that. And we'd sort of kind of appropriate them for our age demo. Uh, and so we would do like confetti. Uh, we would do these giant uh, uh, balloons that were like enormous. We would do uh, vortex cannons. We would do flying toilet paper. And so we'd create all of these interactive elements uh, as well as songs that would be interactive, like, uh, you know, um, Buckets and Cans, where they're playing music with their hands and their feet, um, uh, as well as Jump Up, things like that, where the dance moves were there, uh, or spinning their arms and who could spin the fastest, things like that. Uh, so we, we definitely learn how to kind of uh, uh, evolve the, the live show so that it was so engaging that even a five-year-old, six-year-old could last the whole time and be zonked by the end, but never really took a break. You know, it was that kind of, you know, that, that, that kind of energy. And I think one of the cool things is early on, you know, we've always looked at kids as creators instead of consumers. And so we never really had an intermission um, for what we did. Uh, you know, we just had our show. Um, you know, it was just kind of this one thing uh to really they were kind of, they, the, the one tour they produced they were trying to make us do the intermission and we yeah they, they wanted us to do the intermission so that they could sell stuff during the middle right. of the show we we like, you know, we, when we, yeah we basically said no we don't <laughs> want to do that <laughs> uh and we were successful in them listening to us so. i'm surprised yeah. yeah but you know you carrie you uh you asked about um pressure and writing song i will say this we have a few song the songs that have become like these absolutely tried and true live show songs like jump up or this one rolling um or buckets um i don't think when we you can't you can't just say it now i'm gonna make one of those and it happens yeah. and like we've we've had a bunch where we've we think we have you know like we made i'm thinking of uh um, hey rock <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's one song is like we were messing around in the studio one time and that, that was really fun to do like G, 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 hey, G, 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 C, C, D, you know, play like simple, like power chords. And we thought, this is it, we've got a new, and then we, we finished the song out with some terrible verses, and it, and then we tried it a few times, and it did not work, you know, and so you can't, uh, you can't always engineer it the way you think you can engineer right. it. Um, some of that stuff is, uh, what I think is true, that the, the, the more, we should always rehearse more, honestly, but the more you rehearse for a show, the more you mess around with stuff, you come up with things that are going to work that, are, that will be in, in, funny or whatever. Also, there's things like the first couple of tours we did were more scripted. They had some narrative stuff going on and, and props. We, we violated the rule of what you just said, which was that you don't need all the other stuff. <laughs> and um, we all joke that we wish we had applied that philosophy much earlier because, uh, you know, we would have spent less money. But um uh, we had a tour with, where we built this giant robot called Rockomatic, and um, it was actually awesome. This this yeah, piece, it was. That piece was great. There was a guy inside the robot behind the drum set, and he would operate the robot. And he, it was you know, but even the jokes, like you think some jokes are going to work, and we had jokes that we tried thirty seven times, thinking <laughs> this time it's going to work, and it didn't work. No, like the, I, you know, the what is catch, right? Yeah, what is like, what is catch? We had this joke where uh, uh, <laughs> I hey, think Dave was super proud of that one. <laughs> yeah, it's like hey, 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 Rockomatic, catch! Hey, I don't hear that. It was hey, Rockomatic, catch! And he he threw whatever it was at him, and it hits him and falls on the ground. And he says, "What is catch?" <laughs> and we thought that was great, but <laughs> we were the only ones. <laughs> like literally, like dead silence in a in a room of two thousand people, and we'd be like. 
Yeah, it was that was a fun con, uh, fun tour because we had this. I mean, Rocco was a fifteen foot tall wow. robot metal. that was covered. Like, yeah, this thing was made out of like sheet metal. Yeah, and he was covered, and it was like this King Kong reveal when when we revealed it. You would hear this audible gasp across the audience, that, and then Rocco would come to life, and his arms would move, and we had this wonderful interaction with him through through the whole show. Uh, but yeah, some of those jokes that uh, that we we thought were just winners, just like, you know, songs that, oh, this is a winner, you know, sometimes just don't happen to be that. Well, way. like, here we go, remember? Yeah, oh gosh, I was so proud of that song. We have this song, it's got this great chorus. Again, you know, that's another one, the chorus is better than the verse, but, yeah, uh, yeah here we go. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Here we go now. It's just really like, it's kind of almost like a Tom Petty thing. And we got all excited and we, uh, debuted it at a show in new orleans it's like after second season or something yeah 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 like we're gonna have a new concert opener and it was atrocious <laughs> <laughs> lead balloon <laughs> <laughs> it's like we are terrible <laughs> it was so, like uh, it, it was like uh, early on uh we have this we you know obviously we have tons of re you know uh, inside jokes but uh we were playing at some festival i guess maybe it's like oh. Perry county or something like that and i was like uh let's do this call and response and, and I'll get them to, to, you know, I'll say this and then they'll say that. And I think it, it, it turned out like, uh, Hey, 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 hey now you sing. And no one did it. And I was like, rich. And so, you know, this, and yeah, I think, I think, my rescue happened, at the time. I, was, I think I had encouraged you <laughs> to try a call and response. And, but if you recall, this is a this is very early. This is pre Disney. Yeah. This is Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and there was a crowd of one or two. <laughs> and and, um, and uh, you try to crowd call and response, and 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 not oh. only did there was no one to respond, but like you didn't. I don't think you knew what to sing or something. Oh like that. no! And he just on mic was like, Bitch. <laughs> and uh, so that that yeah. that that lives in uh, infamy within the movie. Yeah, we haven't let him forget it. Scott also <laughs> fell down running on stage one time, and it's on video. And, uh, Go watch got, the Rockomatic DVD. It's I will there. have to. I I fell several times. Luckily, that didn't make make the video. <laughs> Plus, so you're I, padded, right? You're padded. Well. That's what, <laughs> you that's what people think. <laughs> Let me tell you, when you when you go down in that seven foot costume, it's a. Uh, I'm sure oh, it's it's an, it's an adventure. Trying to um, we're trying to get up, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I learned how to get up because the embarrassment factor is uh, it's pretty over pretty overwhelming when you fall in front of three four thousand people. Oh my God! Yeah, at least they can't see you turn red. That's that's right. That's right. But it definitely happened. Hey, did you ever see? Did you ever see? Um, I think what's the movie? Bla is it Blades of Glory? With yeah, Will I've Ferrell? seen. Yes, yeah. Wait, that's another mover inside joke. Uh, when, when, uh, when, he, when he's in the beginning of the movie, when he's in Gr what, Grim Gremlets on Ice or something, he's yes, doing like, yes, yes. You know, and the and the manager comes in, he's like, "Come on, I need you out there. That we got, we're three quarters full." <laughs> yeah. And so, like, when, when, if we're playing an off off show somewhere, you know, in some place, we'll be like, "Come on, guys, Gremlets on Ice." <laughs> <laughs> it's three quarters full. It's tough. It can be tough. Well, we've we've done that. We did one in uh, in Miami. And we thought it would be a great idea to do the show in Spanish. Oh. What we didn't realize is that in Miami, it's Cuban. Yeah. And we did Mexico Spanish. Oh. And that oh. didn't go too well. Oh, no. <laughs> Trial and <laughs> error. Yeah. It was. Uh, I mean, we were selling out every show. And then, yeah. And, and they came to us and said, um, yeah, you kind of missed <laughs> with the, <laughs> the language. Good intentions. You you completely whip. So yeah, yeah, you, you get points for trying, but that's yes, it. yes. Hey, real, but before I lose you guys, I want to uh, ask you real quick. TV show. Where were you coming up with these ideas? Because you've got a TV show now, right? You've got to come up with some different things because live is completely different. So some of the elements that you put on that TV show that people love, where did they come from? Well, you know, I mean, a lot of, you know, whether it be Warehouse Mouse or Knit Knots, um, Nina was actually in our uh, early iterations and our idea was Carla. Uh, in fact, when we did the pilot, her name was Carla. Um, so I mean, a lot of those things were, 
you know, just part of our brainstorm um, sessions. You know, I, I think Knit Knots was such a great character. He, he only made it in season one of our three seasons. Uh, apparently he didn't test well, but I always looked at him as such a wonderful foil, a uh, non-threatening foil uh, to the movers. You know, he was in beige, everything in his office was beige. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes, you know, especially when we were doing the show, whether it be like those original kind of ideas that we had, or even, you know, we were coming up with premises um, for future episodes of the movers and pitching them just like the writer's team would do. Um, you know, one, I think the one, the one premise that never got made that I thought would have made an awesome episode is two of the movers get locked in one of the uh, rooms of the idea warehouse and two of the movers are having to entertain a local journalist who's come over to kind of feature the movers as brainstormers, you know, and problem solvers. And here we have this problem where two guys are locked in a room. So the two have to kind of entertain her while the separate we're trying to brainstorm a way to solve the problem. And I was like, oh, that's such a great idea because it, it, it seemed like it lent itself to a lot of kind of like slapstick and funny humor and... Sure. Uh, uh, and then echoing a lot of the the idea of problem solving and, and 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 creativity, and that was like one of the premises that I thought was like a surefire winner that just never kind of made it up the uh, the thing. But um, you know, I, I think the cool thing is is we we bounce ideas from one another and in such a way that we we kind of like can take a a, a seed and and really watch it grow through a lot of like kind of the nurturing that all the other guys kind of put together with it. Uh, so. You know, I'm proud of like our creative um, legacy, uh, not only in the show and ideas, but also in the songs. So you've got more music coming? Yes. More music coming? Going into the studio in September, and then uh, we'll be looking hopefully uh, a release closer uh, either at the end of 2020 or the beginning of 2021. We'll see. Uh, when it all kind of the timeline fa falls. But uh, yeah, we've got some new songs coming. So we're super excited about it. Really is. And then I'm wonderful. guessing whenever you can get back on the road. Definitely. Yeah, so we had a bunch of stuff that got postponed. We were on, we were looking forward to another trip to Asia in April. And that, oh, you know, cross your fingers, we'll get to go do it. Yeah. Um, but obviously that's anyone's guess, really. Right. <clears throat> um, you know, we'll just see how the event business can resuscitate. Yeah, we we uh we have a lot of fans in Canada. We had like a, a little kind of like a almost artisan res residency kind of thing that we we had planned, and of course that got canceled. So we definitely want to go up north, see our fans up in, a, in the Great White North, and uh, uh, and then uh, you know tour the United States and and continue uh, looking at, at the UK. Now there are two things that like I would love for us to do, and that's one rich sort of hinted at earlier, and that's to go to South America and play some of the places that we've had such a warm fan base, uh, as well as Australia, you know, like three of our top five streaming Spotify cities are in Australia. Wow. So, um, that's, that it's like one of those things like, okay, well, Hey, let's, you know, that's, those are the kinds of metrics that you're like, Hey, well, let's go play. Let's go meet these fans that are, that are, are listening to our music. And, and you said that the other night, I was thinking that, and I know people always talk about Australia it's one of those markets. It's hard to tour like for the big acts because right. they've only got a few markets, right? Yeah. And you got to cover all this distance. But I think for us, we just go lean. Yeah. And, and just break even if we have to. But I want to go. I want to go play in Melbourne, Brisbane, and Sydney. That sounds yeah. boring. And I think that's the one thing that, that, that's evolved with us is that a lot of times we'll do things for the experience, hoping to break even, you know, financially. Yeah. But, sure. but the experience certainly is just as more valuable as, you know, any financial reward. Of course, you know, you want to make sure you get paid for your creative sure. endeavor. But but for us, a lot of times it's like, hey, you know, we have fans there. Let's go play for the fans and, and let's hope we, we, we break even. And if we do, if we make it a little bit, that's great. But if not, you know, we've, we've done essentially what we've, we've set out to do. Yeah. And one thing, one silver lining for us, um, obviously, you know, the pandemic is not a good situation. And I'm, yeah. our hearts go out to any families who are suffering because of it. But um, uh, balancing out the fact that all of our, that everyone's shows got canceled is that, um, Movers went back on Disney Plus uh, right before the pandemic right. struck in many countries. So it's possible that, you know, with everyone being home and discovering things, we will have a, a good new wave of uh, fans that we can go um, entertain in the coming year or two, whenever mm -hmm. we can 
get back out there safely. Well, the next time you're Austin, you've got one here that's going to come. Awesome. <laughs> I'm going to come check out the, the movers. How Definitely. far are you from Austin? Oh, three hours. Okay. Oh, okay, good. Three which hours. Direction, which direction are you? So I'm up north. So Dallas, Fort Worth. You're close to Dallas. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. But I, this is, this is my home. I travel all over this state. So. Yeah, would love I will, to. Definitely need to meet, meet in Austin sometime. I would love, I would love, to, it's such a great city. Awesome. It, What's your is, t-shirt, by the way? So. Oh yeah, okay. I thought it was. There you yeah. go. Yep. I am, I'm a, quite a proud Texan, That's but awesome. I love Louisiana. I've had, Are you a Cowboys fan? No, I, I am not a Cowboys fan. It's a long story, but the short of that story is that I actually was born in Washington, D.C. Ooh, Washington <laughs> did, football team. I did not want to come to Texas when I was a young boy, and so my mom was a huge Cowboy fan, so I couldn't be a Cowboy fan because I just didn't like Texas, but I couldn't be a Redskin fan because – my mom hated the Redskins, and, yeah. and I didn't want to do that to her. So crazy enough, I'm actually a Minnesota Viking fan, which All right. makes All right. no sense. Other, and it, I liked purple before Barney, um, <laughs> but I think it was just a neutral. They had a good run in the set. It was like when I was a kid, I actually grew up in D.C., but the, the, it was like the Steelers or the Cowboys were the two big teams, and you yeah. get their, their, their jerseys and stuff at Sears. But then um, Vikings were also kind of like a cool oddball pick. You know, they were yeah. like a cool, yeah. like, they had cool uniforms and everything. Well, Frank Tarkington. <laughs> absolutely. I got, I, I got to tell you, I came down um, with a good friend of mine to the Superdome um, to Ooh. watch, a, watch a, a Monday night game with the Vikings okay. in New Orleans, and I'm a very proud fan. So I had my jersey on. <laughs> Probably not a great idea to do that. <laughs> As I found out, my friend said, I'll never go to another game with you. They were very nice fans, but they definitely let me know they didn't care for my uh, – my jersey. Your jersey. <laughs> when someone is hurling profanities at you, do you tell them, hey, by the way, I'm Barney the Dinosaur. Thank you very much. I do not, but wouldn't it be funny if they knew what I uh, – Well, I speaking of which, what's with you and Purple with the dinosaur and the Vikings? I uh, don't know. Started as a kid, <laughs> and, and I'll tell you that you'll laugh even further. I'm a huge Prince fan too. Oh, that's great. The, and the it's, trifecta. It's, yeah, but I was a Viking fan, then I was a Prince fan, and then you know I obviously didn't plan to be a purple dinosaur. Wait, <laughs> where, where did you grow up in DC, and when did you leave? What year? Oh, I left. Well, that would have been '78. And where were you? Uh, right in the district. I was born in the district. So, uh, my dad was in politics, and uh, my mom finally said no more politics. And my dad was born in Fort Worth. Gotcha. So right. we came. We came to Texas. Where were you? I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland. Oh, okay. Yeah, we were in Maryland a lot. That's um, funny. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, isn't it funny? Small world. Yeah, well, we're listening to all these stories and your influences. Those are my influences too. So awesome. We we all kind of have the connection. Is there any way you can give me a little movers to finish out this episode? Yeah. What What do you need us to do? Everybody shout! What's a big idea? Hey, what's the big idea? Imagination movers are music to your ears. That's right. We're music to your ears. Guys, thank you so much. This has just been an absolute blast. I could sit and talk to you forever. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd love to have you back at some point. Sure. Definitely. Love to. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's so fascinating for me to hear these, these stories. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, you know, we've had a, a rich history and uh and a lot, history. yeah a lot, a lot to talk about that's right there you go and yeah it's awesome. probably a good thing it was just two of us because you say you could listen to us all night yeah but if all four of us were here it would have just gone on interminably <laughs> <laughs> like everyone's gonna talk and say so many things we, we're talkers <laughs> oh, well, we can I, be. I i love it i love right. it thank you so much for being on thank, thank you. you and thank you for watching purple roads remember to keep your eyes ears and your heart open and you'll find your purple road. We'll see you next week.